African American legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, education, and the media. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and joining us on today's program is Pierre Sutton, who's the chairman and CEO of Inner City Broadcasting Company, which is really the first of the great black-oriented radio uh, companies, broadcasting companies, media companies. Glad to have you with us today, Pierre. We all call you Pepe, so we'll be talking to you as Pepe. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Okay, here. really great. Uh, tell us about inner city broadcasting. As you know, I know a lot about it, but maybe our audience doesn't know what is our role in the market, what do we try to do, and just how successful have we been? Well, uh, to, to explain that, you would have to go to its origins. Um, inner city broadcasting had its beginnings uh, actually in, during the riots of 1968. My father, Percy Sutton, was on the radio talking to the people of our community. And the owner at the time said that when he decided to retire from the business, he would uh, entertain and offer to purchase from Percy Sutton. So uh, That was on the old W? WLIB -I at 125th right. Street in Lenox and Avenue. And Novick was the Harry chair. Novick, that that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So um, uh, about two years later, we were able to put together $364,000 of various uh, people. All of them were the doctors, teachers, preachers, um, people who really uh, didn't think that we'd ever make any money, but wanted to have uh, some participation in the media that impacted upon our community. So we got this little $364,000 together, and we uh, purchased that AM daytime radio station for $1.9 million. That the $364,000 was, of course, the cash we had to have in order to secure the loan. And anyway, um, uh, that radio station cost us $1.9 million. Now, the FM station, which we got two years after that, which is WBLS here in New York, uh, cost us $1.1 million. Uh, in those days, AM radio was more expensive than FM because you could uh, the um, FM signals would bounce off the leaves of trees. You just really couldn't capture the FM signal on a, on a, on a, your radio. So Particularly on car radio. Yeah, it was yeah. really, really hard. But then this fellow from Boston developed something called a circular polarized antenna, which enabled us to receive FM signals. So we were the first ones to do that in New York. And as a result, uh, uh, when we went on the air with WBLS, people could hear us. And uh, people enjoy um, black music. Uh, it's every, everybody seems to enjoy black music. And we, uh, what we did that was different from other radio stations is that we did not have shouting disc jockeys. We had all, all, all the disc jockeys were teachers. They had been instructors. And so we had people who could speak English. And we didn't have, uh, as I said, shouting disc jockeys. We didn't say, sell uh, prayer claws or holy bricks mm -hmm. or finish your basement for $10 down and $99 a month for the rest of your life. We had uh, legitimate... Um, uh, commercials, and so uh, we became the number one radio station in America. And just I think a very that short needs to be repeated. A lot of people have heard that, mm -hmm. but don't really understand what they mean. When you say the number one radio station in America, mm -hmm. that means you had the most listeners, you had the greatest audience share in the largest market in the country. That's correct. That was a long time ago. That was uh, Twenty-five since then, years ago. <laughs> <laughs> since then, of course. When people see that you're doing well, uh, other people will try to do the same thing. And of course, uh, uh, other radio stations broadcasting to the community uh, tend to erode uh, your position. So it's, it's very difficult today to uh, to achieve that kind of prominence. And it varies from station to station even now. It does. It does. It goes uh, back in terms of ratings, I think mm -hmm. your ratings at that time, what, seven, eight? Nine, ten, nine yes. which really means you're getting ten percent of the audience. That's right. Now, uh, even with the top station, you might get four percent of the audience. That's right. So That's that right. Uh, uh, a lot more FM radio stations, a lot of AM radio stations, but there, there are some, there are some sixty radio stations in New York City. So it's very hard. Every it's very hard for any station to remain on top for very long. And FM seems to be where most of the ratings are. Although I understand mm -hmm. that some AM stations, like a news station might have high ratings, yes. and I know uh, WBLS's companion station, WLIB, which is a talk-oriented, mm -hmm. uh, it gets a lot of publicity. I don't know exactly what the ratings are, but it, it, it is an outreach to the African-American Well, community. that is our true purpose in, uh, uh, 
in life, really. The FM station provides us with, uh, in New York, provides us with the, with the uh, uh, revenue so that we can provide the service that WLIB is. But in addition to the radio, uh, inner city broadcasting does a number of other things which are media related. Mm, yeah. So we have other radio stations uh, in California and, and in uh, Texas, but uh, we are also involved in cable. Uh, we have, um, uh, we're partners in the cable system in Queens known as QUIX. We uh, uh, are in the process of purchasing another cable system in, uh, in Philadelphia. We um, uh, have been involved in PCS. Uh, just recently, we won franchises, our little group, uh, won franchises for the development of uh, personal communication systems in North Carolina and in Virginia. That means cellular phones, mainly. Well, it's the next uh, generation of cellular right. phones. Uh, cellular phones now get cut off if you go under a, a bridge or whatever, and, uh, but the PCS is going to be much more consistent in terms of its, uh, its communications capabilities so that data transfers can be, uh, can be run with confidence through PCS. So we're, we're trying to stay uh, with, the, uh, with the, um, the cutting edge, if you will, of, of today's uh, world of communications. If you were to summarize the purpose of inner city broadcasting today as against, let's say, 25 or 30 years ago mm -hmm. when we were breaking in, first mm -hmm. making an inroad of African Americans mm -hmm. into the media business. What would you say the purpose of inner city well, is I, today? Well, uh, we, we, uh, we provide a leadership role, really, in, in the industry. Uh, one of the other hats that I wear is that I'm the chairman of the National Association of Black-Owned Broadcasters. And we started uh, some 18 years ago, this organization, for the purpose of uh, getting together, knowing other black folks in the business, trying to encourage black folks to get into the business, and, the, and uh, lobbying in uh, Congress and in, uh, at the FCC for the purpose of easing uh, the entry of African Americans into the, the telecommunications industry. How many uh, black-owned radio stations are there now in the country? Well, be be beginning with the first one that we started. Well, the. the, the uh, Actually, ours was the 13th uh, black-owned radio station in America. Mm -hmm. Now they're uh, uh, about 250, but that's nothing when you can compare uh, to the number of radio stations. It's something like 10,000 radio stations in America. So, so we've really got a long ways to go. It really means two tenths of one percent of radio stations are owned by blacks. Yet, as uh, you notice by listening. Mm -hmm a number of radio stations use what we call black music formats yes, yes. and even black talk formats, uh, which I think is positive and that uh, people are recognized that the African-American audience is a major audience. But what are some of the deterrents that keep more African-Americans from getting into broadcasting? Well, today it's, it's largely the price tag. Mm -hmm. uh, people are now uh, selling radio stations for 10 times projected cash, I'm, I'm sorry, 20 times projected cash flow. When I uh, first came into this business, there was uh, a couple of things. Uh, first, when, I, uh, when we first entered this business, we had to uh, ascertain what the community's needs were, and we had to develop programming to meet those needs. Uh, what has happened since then, they've taken those rules and disbanded them so that um, uh, now, there isn't any benchmark by which to measure whether or not a broadcaster has acquitted himself or herself with responsibility. Moreover, they, uh, there used to be a rule which limited uh, a radio company from owning more than one AM and one FM radio station in any market. And you can only have a total of seven stations. Well, all of those caps, if you will, have been removed. That's part of the Republican move toward uh, yes privatization, free enterprise, opening things up. Right. The suggestion is that competition will make better programming. Uh, what's your perception of the result of that? I think you call them duopolies, where a company might own two or three radio stations in a given market, mm. and one will be at the high level, one will be at the low level. What, does, what impact does that really have, let's say, on stations like WBLS? Well, what it, what I think that ultimately the impact that it has is that uh, uh, we're looking, there's so, so much gobbling up of radio stations, and that's why the prices are so high now, that uh, ultimately you're looking at no more than three or four radio companies left in America. And that's dangerous in, uh, from my perspective because you won't be able to 
feel the variety of, 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 um, of thought on radio that you uh, are presently able to, uh, to get. But on the other hand, there, let's just say ABC. ABC used to have one station in about 10 major cities. And in that way, they could control a much larger audience. And of course, when you control your audience, you control what they listen to. You yes. actually can, you're supposed to be non-political, but obviously mm -hmm. you begin to position yourself in terms of certain ways. And the idea is by eliminating that, you would bring new people into the field and you would not have this national control of the airwaves. Uh, how do you respond to that argument? Well, uh, anytime you have fewer uh, owners of properties, uh, the fewer the owners, the, the, less, um, the less they really care <laughs> because they're, they're so big, they're not going to, they can uh, in large measure influence who gets elected. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I'm just, uh, I just like to see greater diversity. Uh, there are, um, in, in Canada, there isn't a single black-owned radio station, not one. Uh, they are, uh, they are, we built the radio stations for, uh, uh, for Dakota Sioux, Lakota Sioux in, uh, in, in, in uh, South Dakota. That's the only Indian-owned radio station in America. Uh, and they are not likely, there, aren't, uh, there isn't a great likelihood that more will, will come about. Uh, we did that because we are who we are. We, we're, we're just that way. Uh, I don't see that happening with, uh, say, Disney that just bought the ABC stations. Uh, they don't have that kind of interest in, uh, in uh, diversity of programming. They're, they have an interest in controlling things. Well, what about a duopoly? A duopoly or a triopoly, they'll have three different formats. Well, how, that's, that's even how, scarier. Okay. <laughs> because? Well, be, it, because... Let's say one decides to take a liberal tack and other decides to take a conservative tack. But tack. they don't do that. that practice, as a practical matter, that owner determines what, what, the, what the nature of that programming is going to be. Okay, let me ask you. You're the owner. Do you uh, determine the nature of the program on WLIB, WBLS? Yes, I do. In... Yeah. in, uh, in uh, in all respects, I'm responsible for it. I, actually, I don't do right. it myself uh, uh, all the time. Sometimes I do. But when WBLS mm -hmm. began to take on gangster rap, uh, I think they had mm -hmm. pickets around the station. They didn't like that. We didn't. We didn't think because we are. Uh, I live in Harlem, and uh, I can see the impact that that, uh, that some of the lyrics can have on our community. It's just being. It's just about being responsible. Uh, I, uh, just like you don't yell fire in a crowded theater, you, you don't say shoot in a community that's got a number of guns. And, and we just, uh, th there are other ways to express uh, your feelings other than uh, 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 lyrics which uh, demean women, which call for violence. Uh, just, we don't need that. Well, actually, uh, the backlash, of, uh, uh, the fallout of that, not backlash, was that in the city got a lot of uh, compliments, and you personally mm -hmm. got the compliments mm -hmm. for taking a stand, yet mm -hmm. at the same time, these very record companies were saying you were trying to censor them. That's how, right. <laughs> how, do you, how do you answer that? You can't, this is the you can't please everybody. First Amendment question. <laughs> you can't please everybody. We're not, we're not uh, censoring. We just don't, we have the right to play what we want to play and, and not to play what we don't want to play. And we think that if, 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 a, if a lyrical content is dangerous for a community, we're not going to do it. That won't stop my competition from doing it. They, they like to see that. But how do you answer then a, a white-oriented company who will not play black music? And then we say, well, they should be playing us. How, how do you well, answer that? Well, that's, that's the value of having black-owned radio stations because we can play we our own outlet. music. We have an outlet here. Uh, to, uh, there are no uh, black-owned radio stations in uh, Dallas, in Miami, in um, San Francisco, other than ours. Um, and actually, your, your station, San Francisco, covers Denver. a broad market. Too. Yes. Yeah. Denver. I mean, you name the major city, and there, it, it, uh, I can tell you, make, make it easy, there's a black-owned radio station in Detroit, Stevie Wonder owns one in, in Los Angeles, and that's it for major cities. Mm -hmm. What about Washington, D.C.? I'm sorry, yes. Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. has a, has a black-owned radio station, and Baltimore does as well. And some of the smaller cities, I think, in mm -hmm. North Carolina. A North number of the, in, in, in the southeast where we are, mm -hmm. where a great deal of our population resides, there are a number of, uh, of black-owned stations. But our numbers are dwindling, I must say. When people start to uh, throw around uh, ridiculous amounts of money for the uh, purchase of radio stations, people you know, see the 
see the money and they say, well, you know, I've, this is a lot of money, it's too much for me to turn down, and they go out of the business. You know, WLIB, your AM outlet, has been criticized for being too active in politics. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, they've been falsely accused of being anti Semitic, of mm -hmm. race baiting, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yet at the same time, they represent probably the major outlet of talk and uh, community orientation in New York City. Uh, how do you balance out the criticism that you get for WLAB with the criticism that you're leveling against other parts of the media for trying to control or direct the community's thought? Well, that's a good question, Doctor. I, I think that uh, we uh, don't try to justify our actions. We believe that, uh, that uh, we have a responsibility since no one else will really be addressing the, uh, the issues of the black community except us. We've got to do it. That's the reason why we got into this business in the first place, so that we could address the, the concerns of our community. And uh, uh, if there was a, a, a white owner of a radio station, he's just simply not going to let you, uh, as a black man, do that kind of stuff. Just not going to let you talk like that. We have when you say talk like that, you mean talk to the issue? Because sometimes to, LIB is criticized for being too graphic in describing the race relations, particularly name calling among certain whites and so well, on. Well, it's a stark reality, mm -hmm. uh, but we don't do that. You see, uh, if you turn to some radio talk radio stations, you'll hear the host himself mm -hmm. saying things about other people. Other people. Main, sometimes blacks. Yeah. Right. Oftentimes blacks. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do that. Our listeners feel pain, and they express that pain. We don't express the pain. We we. Uh, see ourselves as, as providing the opportunity for people to communicate with one another, uh, sort of a two-way mirror on, on our community. Well, that's where your call-ins come in, but I know in some instances, because I do listen to the station, uh, someone will cut off a, a caller because the caller is really ranting and possibly not focusing on the issue yes. as well. Mm -hmm. And then some people criticize the station for not letting, why did you cut him off? Why did you cut her off? You just can't please everybody, <laughs> what can I say? We try to be responsible in all respects. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to get the information out to, to the community, but it's, it's, not, uh, it's not in our, in our best interest to, to fall into a trap of, of baiting. And uh, we, we're concerned about education, we're concerned about housing, we're concer concerned about uh, human rights, but we, but, it, it, it serves very little purpose to, to, to do name calling. Mm -hmm. And when people start doing name calling, that's not the kind of thing that we, that we uh, actually uh, like to see. That's obviously a very responsible position. Mm -hmm. But you know, in modern radio, you ranging from A to B, and I won't want to name names, there are people, mainly from the white community, mm -hmm. who do all kinds of name calling and get millions of dollars for it. Right. Uh, to mm -hmm. your credit, I think mm -hmm. you have uh, tried to avoid that. But then how do black people really get an impact on those white orientation? stations? What can they do? What, other than the fact you exist and you're a counter force, mm -hmm. what can those of us in the black community who don't uh, like or agree or feel we're being demeaned other than go to the FCC, which well, they that, have done on occasion? Well, that, um, unfortunately, that, uh, your recourse to the FCC is, uh, is, uh, is not what it used to be, because mm -hmm. you don't have any rules anymore. Mm -hmm. Before there were rules, and you could really uh, challenge a radio station's license to broadcast. And uh, well, we, what about times, uh, obscenity? That's a rule, isn't that's, it? That's, uh, oh. that's a fast-fading rule, too. Yeah, because I think uh, one of the uh, radio people was fined a million dollars for obscenities, mm -hmm. and then the next day he went on to use the same thing. Same thing. They, 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 uh, they, they are pushing the envelope there. There's a, it's called shock radio, mm -hmm. and it's shocking. Well, again, let's look at the First Amendment. This country prides itself on the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, mm -hmm. freedom of association. Mm -hmm. How can you sustain the First Amendment and at the same time not have some of these egregious outrages that occur when the First Amendment is exercised? What's the counter to that? What's the antidote to that? The, the, the seven-second delay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> very good, very we, good. <laughs> we have a delay mechanism so that when somebody says something untoward, we can cut that part off. <laughs> but I was thinking about the more general thing, stations that really take very extreme positions. We mm -hmm. have the conservative right, we have mm -hmm. the ultra-liberal left mm -hmm. uh, pushing things hour after hour. If you drive on the highways and have your car radio on, uh, mm -hmm. particularly at AM, you hear some of the most outlandish things in the world. But yet, that's what we stand for. 
That's and America. If, and uh, say, if a stranger <laughs> came here, say, well, what are these people up to? Uh, yet at the same time, it's the First Amendment that has been the strength of our society. So what is the role of media in walking through this minefield of free it, it, speech? It obviously, it's the most difficult uh, question that we've, we'll face today. Mm -hmm. We're just pleased to be able to face that, mm -hmm. that question. Uh, that we have we, the option, right? Yes. Uh, we just recently uh, formed a partnership to create the first black-owned radio station in South Africa, in Johannesburg. We went, we went on the air in, uh, in uh, August. Kaya FM, which means home in, in, um, in um, local tongue. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I try to talk to people in Nigeria about the same thing, they don't want to hear it in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, Swaziland, we're going to build a station in Swaziland. We're, we're, we're seeing what we can do to open up the, the, the opportunity for uh, the creation of, of black-owned media in, uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, on, on the African continent. but. Oftentimes, there's a strong resistance from the government because just this kind of thing, the issue of who's going to say what about, about the current uh, government. Um, uh, I have the feeling that we may see one in, uh, in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a hard thing to get people who have been very comfortable in controlling the, uh, the images and the messages to, get, to relinquish that control. Uh, again, I'm just very pleased that we, uh, we uh, uh, are living in a society where, when we, that, that we can uh, express ourselves as best we can. See, I find it interesting that inner city broadcasting will extend its knowledge and experience to the African continent, for example. Mm -hmm. And as you know, many of the African governments in the past, uh, though run by Africans themselves, mm -hmm. uh, have been very repressive. And one of the things that a little radio can do a little signal can give somebody to talk about some of these oppressions. Some of them are obvious. If you see the uh, ruling class riding around in Mercedes and so on, and other folks living on a dollar and eating on a dollar a day, that can be seen. But when it goes on the air and 100,000 people hear it or 500,000 people hear it, it has an impact. But then going back to the role of radio now, uh, because television has been our main mode of transmission of news. Most people get their news from television. They get their entertainment and their sports from television. What then is the role of radio in our society other than giving us some nice music to listen to? Mindless boogie, no. <laughs> uh, the, actually, the, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, when you hear ABC saying uh, that uh, most people get their news from ABC, it's not uh, the television station that they're getting most of the news from is actually the seven radio networks mm -hmm. that they put together. Mm -hmm. That's how, uh, that's where people get... And those little uh, burbs of news, although I think at uh, BLSLIB you have your own news department. You yes, pull your news from a variety of sources. You just don't pull it off of the wire. And that's right. We have a, we have a full-fledged news uh, gathering operation. That's what I think to be a, the major uh, part of what we do. We, so we have a different attitude about, about the news. We can... Uh, we can look at, a, at, uh, at an event, and a white person will look at the event, and we'll see it entirely mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm. And we report the news as we see it, mm -hmm. and uh, they report the news as they see it. <laughs> and of course, some people will say it's racist, uh, where, because we do report the excesses of the white media and white establishment, mm -hmm. and the suggestion is, well, the media is objective. I think mm -hmm. most people have gone way past that. Because all you have to do is listen to five stations over five minutes. Mm -hmm. And you realize that either they are blind or they have different eyeglasses because there's no s objective way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. So the uh, inner city <clears throat> and the radio stations, not only of inner city but from the African-American ownership, project an African-American perspective. That's and among them, I imagine there are differences of, of opinion even among the African American radio stations. I would say so. We're all different. We, uh, we uh, African people, run the, the gamut of uh, of uh, like of, any of other thought. group of folks. The uh, uh, normal curve. There's a J.C. Watson. Mm -hmm. Was in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, conservative, He's conservative, uh, mm -hmm. uh, unbelievably conservative. Mm -hmm. You have a, a man in the Supreme Court who is very conservative. Mm -hmm. uh, how he got to be conservative, I, I don't know why these people uh, don't see the because things. Because many of them right, were the beneficiaries them. of affirmative action and, and themselves, then, and, then and then come later. out against it. <coughs> you, know, you wonder about people like that. But uh, 
the fact is that there are people who are in broadcasting who who uh, who share those views and who also are African American. Not many, but there are some. But in your role as the president of the Association of African American On Station, you must have a lot of influence in terms of helping to encourage and keep black radio. Well, we moving. we we try to. We uh, we want to develop more uh, opportunities for African Americans in radio. We mm -hmm. were just in Washington testifying on behalf of. Uh, of a, of a black man who's now going to become, we hope, the chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. Mm -hmm. He has pledged himself, uh, pledged to, uh, to uh, uh, work towards the increase of African American ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, and t for him, I think that was rather bold of him to, to, uh, to make those statements before he got confirmed. <laughs> so well, we'll see whether or not he gets confirmed now. I think under your leadership, both Inner City Broadcasting Company and the black radio industry has benefited. I mm -hmm. want to thank uh, Pierre Sutton chairman of Inner City Broadcasting Company for being our guest on today's African American Legends. Well, thanks for having me.